Some private enormities of the Inquisition laid open by a very singular occurrence. When the crown of Spain was contested for in the beginning of the present century by two princes who equally pretended to be sovereignty, France espoused the cause of one competitor and England of the other. The Duke of Berwick, a natural son of James II who abdicated England, commanded the Spanish and French forces and defeated the English at the celebrated Battle of Almanza. The army was then divided into two parts, the one consisting of Spaniards and French, headed by the Duke of Berwick, advanced towards Catalonia, the other body consisting of French troops only, commanded by the Duke of Orleans, proceeded to the conquest of Aragon. As the troops drew near to the city of Aragon, the magistrates came to offer the keys to the Duke of Orleans, but he told them haughtily that they were rebels, and that he would not accept the keys, for he had orders to enter the city through a breach. He accordingly made a breach in the walls with his cannon, and then entered the city through it, together with his whole army. When he had made every necessary regulation here, he departed to subdue other places, leaving a strong garrison at once to overawe and defend, under the command of his lieutenant general, M. de la Galle. This gentleman, though brought up a Roman Catholic, was totally free from superstition. He united great talents with great bravery and was the skillful officer and accomplished gentleman. The Duke, before his departure, had ordered that heavy contributions should be levied upon the city in the following manner. 1. That the magistrates and principal inhabitants should pay a thousand crowns per month for the Duke's table. 2. That every house should pay one pistole which would a monthly amount to 18,000 pistoles. Three, that every convent and monastery should pay a donative proportionable to its riches and rents. The last two contributions to be appropriated to the maintenance of the army. The money levied upon the magistrates and principal inhabitants and upon every house was paid as soon as demanded. But when the persons applied to the heads of convents and monasteries, they found that the ecclesiastics were not so willing, as other people, to part with their cash. Of the donatives to be raised by the clergy, the College of Jesuits to pay 2,000 pistoles, Carmelites 1,000, Augustines 1,000, Dominicans 1,000. M. de la Galle sent to the Jesuits a peremptory order to pay the money immediately. The superior of the Jesuits returned for answer that the clergy to pay money for the army was against all ecclesiastical immunities, and that he knew of no argument which could authorize such a procedure. M. de la Galle then sent four companies of dragoons to quarter themselves in the college with this sarcastic message, quote, to convince you of the necessity of paying the money, I have sent four substantial arguments to your college, drawn from the system of military logic, and therefore, hope you will not need any further admonition to direct your conduct." End quote. These proceedings greatly perplexed the Jesuits, who dispatched an express to court the king's confessor, who was of their order. But the dragoons were much more expeditious in plundering and doing mischief than the courier in his journey, so that the Jesuits, seeing everything going to wreck and ruin, thought proper to adjust the matter amicably and paid the money before the return of their messenger. The Augustans and Carmelites, taking warning by what had happened to the Jesuits, prudently went and paid the money, and by that means escaped the study of military arguments and of being taught logic by dragoons. But the Dominicans, who were all familiars of or agents dependent on the Inquisition, imagined that that very circumstance would be their protection. But they were mistaken. For M. de la Galle neither feared nor respected the Inquisition. The chief of the Dominicans sent word to the military commander that his order was poor and had not any money whatever to pay the donative. For says he, quote, The whole wealth of the Dominicans consists only in the silver images of the apostles and saints, as large as life, which are placed in our church and which it would be sacrilege to remove. End quote. This insinuation was meant to terrify the French commander, whom the inquisitors imagined would not dare to be so profane as to wish for the possession of the precious idols. He, however, sent word that the silver images would make admirable substitutes for money and would be more in character in his possession than in that of the Dominicans themselves. Quote, For, said he, 
while you possess them in the manner you do at the present, they stand up in niches, useless and motionless, without being of the least benefit to mankind in general, or even to yourselves. But when they come into my possession, they shall be useful. I will put them in motion, for I intend to have them coined. When they may travel like the apostles, be beneficial in various places, and circulate for the universal service of mankind. End quote. The inquisitors were astonished at this treatment, which they never expected to receive, even from crowned heads. They therefore determined to deliver their precious images in a solemn procession, that they might excite the people to an insurrection. The Dominican friars were accordingly ordered to march to De La Galle's house with the silver apostles and saints in a mournful manner, having lighted tapers with them and bitterly crying all the way, quote, heresy, heresy, end quote. M. De La Galle, hearing these proceedings, ordered four companies of grenadiers to line the street which led to his house. Each grenadier was ordered to have his loaded fusi in one hand and a lighted taper in the other, so that the troops might either repel force with force or do honor to the farcical solemnity. The friars did all they could to raise the tumult, but the common people were too much afraid of the troops under arms to obey them. The silver images were therefore of necessity delivered up to M. de la Galle, who sent them to the mint and ordered them to be coined immediately. The project of raising an insurrection having failed, the inquisitors determined to excommunicate M. de la Galle unless he would release their precious silver saints from imprisonment in the mint before they were melted down or otherwise mutilated. The French commander absolutely refused to release the images, but said they should certainly travel and do good, upon which the inquisitors drew up the form of excommunication and ordered their secretary to go and read it to M. de la Galle. The secretary punctually performed his commission and read the excommunication deliberately and distinctly. The French commander heard it with great patience and politely told the secretary that he would answer it the next day. When the secretary of the Inquisition was gone, M. de la Galle ordered his own secretary to prepare a form of excommunication exactly like that sent by the Inquisition, but to make his alteration instead of his name to put in those of the Inquisitors. The next morning he ordered four regiments under arms and commanded them to accompany his secretary and act as he directed. The secretary went to the inquisition and insisted upon admittance, which after a great deal of altercation was granted. As soon as he entered he read in an audible voice the excommunication sent by M. de la Galle against the inquisitors. The inquisitors were all present and heard it with astonishment never having before met with any individual who dared to behave so boldly. They loudly cried out against De La Galle as a heretic and said, quote, This was a most daring insult against the Catholic faith, end quote. But to surprise them still more, the French secretary told them that they must remove from their present lodgings, for the French commander wanted to quarter the troops in the Inquisition, as it was the most commodious place in the whole city. The inquisitors exclaimed loudly upon this occasion when the secretary put them under a strong guard and sent them to a place appointed by M. de la Galle to receive them. The inquisitors, finding how things went, begged that they might be permitted to take their private property, which was granted, and they immediately set out for Madrid, where they made the most bitter complaints to the king. But the monarch told them that he could not grant them any redress, as the injuries they had received were from his grandfather the king of France's troops, by whose assistance alone he could be firmly established in his kingdom. Quote, Had it been my own troops, said he, I would have punished them. But as it was, I cannot pretend to exert any authority. End quote. In the meantime, M. de la Galle's secretary set open all the doors of the Inquisition and released the prisoners, who amounted in the whole of 400, and among these were 60 beautiful young women who appeared to form a seraglio for the three principal inquisitors. This discovery, which laid the enormity of the inquisitors so open, greatly alarmed the archbishop, who desired M. de la Galle to send the women to his place, and he would take proper care of them, and at the same time he published an ecclesiastical censure against all such as should ridicule or blame the holy office of the Inquisition. The French commander sent word to the archbishop that the prisoners had either run away or were so securely concealed by their friends 
or even by his own officers, that it was impossible for him to send them back again, and therefore the Inquisition, having committed such atrocious actions, must now put up with their exposure. Some may suggest that it is strange crowned heads and eminent nobles did not attempt to crush the power of the Inquisition and reduce the authority of those ecclesiastical tyrants from whose merciless fangs neither their families nor themselves were secure. But astonishing as it is, superstition hath, in this case, always overcome common sense, and custom operated against reason. One prince indeed intended to abolish the Inquisition, but he lost his life before he became king, and consequently before he had the power so to do, for the very intimation of his design procured his destruction. This was that amiable prince, Don Carlos, son of Philip II, King of Spain, and grandson of the celebrated Emperor Charles V. Don Carlos possessed all the good qualities of his grandfather without any of the bad ones of his father, and was a prince of great vivacity, admirable learning, and the most amiable disposition. He had sense enough to see into the errors of popery and abhorred the very name of the Inquisition. He inveighed publicly against the institution, ridiculed the affected piety of the inquisitors, did all he could to expose their atrocious deeds, and even declared that if he ever came to the crown, he would abolish the inquisition and exterminate its agents. These things were sufficient to irritate the inquisitors against the prince. They, accordingly, bent their minds to vengeance and determined on his destruction. The Inquisitors now employed all their agents and emissaries to spread abroad the most artful insinuations against the prince, and at length raised such a spirit of discontent among the people that the king was under the necessity of removing Don Carlos from court. Not content with this, they pursued even his friends and obliged the king likewise to banish Don Juan, Duke of Austria, his own brother, and consequently uncle to the prince, together with the prince of Parma, nephew to the king, and cousin to the prince, because they well knew that both the Duke of Austria and the Prince of Parma had a most sincere and inviolable attachment to Don Carlos. Some few years after the prince having shown great lenity and favor to the Protestants in the Netherlands, the Inquisition loudly exclaimed against him, declaring that as the persons in question were heretics, the prince himself must necessarily be one, since he gave them countenance. In short, they gained so great an ascendancy over mind of the king who was absolutely a slave to superstition, that, shocking to relate, he sacrificed the feelings of nature to the force of bigotry, and for fear of incurring the anger of the Inquisition, gave up his only son, passing the sentence of death on him himself. The prince indeed had what was termed an indulgence, that is, he was permitted to choose the manner of his death. Roman-like, the unfortunate young hero chose bleeding in the hot bath, when the veins of his arms and legs were opened, he expired gradually, falling a martyr to the malice of the inquisitors and the stupid bigotry of his father. The Persecution of Dr. Agidio Dr. Agidio was educated at the University of Alcala, where he took his several degrees and particularly applied himself to the study of the sacred scriptures and school divinity. When the professor of theology died, he was elected into his place and acted so much to the satisfaction of everyone that his reputation for learning and piety was circulated throughout Europe. Agidio, however, had his enemies, and these laid a complaint against him to the inquisitors, who sent him a citation, and when he appeared to it, cast him into a dungeon. As the greatest part of those who belonged to the cathedral church at Seville, and many persons belonging to the bishopric of Dortois, highly approved of the doctrines of Agidio, which they thought perfectly consonant with true religion, they petitioned the emperor in his behalf. Though the monarch had been educated a Roman Catholic, he had too much sense to be a bigot, and therefore sent an immediate order for his enlargement. He soon after visited the church of Valladolid, and did everything he could to promote the cause of religion. Returning home, he soon after fell sick, and died in an extreme old age. The inquisitors, having been disappointed of gratifying their malice against him while living, determined, as the emperor's whole thoughts were engrossed by a military expedition, to wreak their vengeance on him when dead. 
Therefore, soon after he was buried, they ordered his remains to be dug out of the grave, and a legal process being carried on, they were condemned to be burnt, which was executed accordingly. The Persecution of Dr. Constantine Dr. Constantine, an intimate acquaintance of the already mentioned Dr. Agidio, was a man of uncommon natural abilities and profound learning. Exclusive of several modern tongues, he was acquainted with the Latin, Greek, and Hebrew languages, and perfectly well knew not only the sciences called abstruse, but those arts which come under the denomination of polite literature. His eloquence rendered him pleasing, and the soundness of his doctrines a profitable preacher. And he was so popular that he never preached but to a crowded audience. He had many opportunities of rising in the church, but never would take advantage of them, for if a living of greater value than his own was offered him, he would refuse it, saying, quote, I am content with what I have. End quote. And he frequently preached so forcibly against simony that many of his superiors, who were not so delicate upon the subject, took umbrage at his doctrines upon that head. Having been fully confirmed in Protestantism by Dr. Egidio, he preached boldly such doctrines only as were agreeable to gospel purity and uncontaminated by the errors which had at various times crept into the Romish church. For these reasons, he had many enemies among the Roman Catholics and some of them were fully determined on his destruction. A worthy gentleman named Scoberia, having erected a school for divinity lectures, appointed Dr. Constantine to be reader therein. He immediately undertook the task and read lectures by portions on the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Canticles, and was beginning to expound the book of Job when he was seized by the inquisitors. Being brought to examination, he answered with such precaution that they could not find any explicit charge against him, but remained doubtful in what manner to proceed when the following circumstances occurred to determine them. Dr. Constantine had deposited with a woman named Isabella Martin several books, which to him were very valuable, but which he knew in the eyes of the Inquisition were exceptionable. This woman, having been informed against as a Protestant, was apprehended, and after a small process, her goods were ordered to be confiscated. Previous, however, to the officers coming to her house, the woman's son had removed away several chests full of the most valuable articles. Among these were Dr. Constantine's books. A treacherous servant gave intelligence of this to the inquisitors, and an officer was dispatched to the son to demand the chests. The son, supposing the officer only came for Constantine's books, said, quote, I know what you come for, and I will fetch them to you immediately." End quote. He then fetched Dr. Constantine's books and papers when the officer was greatly surprised to find what he did not look for. He, however, told the young man that he was glad these books and papers were produced, but nevertheless he must fulfill the end of his commission, which was to carry him and the goods he had embezzled before the inquisitors, which he did accordingly, for the young man knew it would be in vain to expostulate or resist, and therefore quietly submitted to his fate. The inquisitors, being thus possessed of Constantine's books and writings, now found matter sufficient to form charges against him. When he was brought to a re-examination, they presented one of his papers and asked him if he knew the handwriting. Perceiving it was his own, he guessed the whole matter, confessed the writing, and justified the doctrine it contained, saying, quote, In that, and all my other writings, I have never departed from the truth of the gospel but have always kept in view the pure precepts of Christ as he delivered them to mankind." End quote. After being detained upwards of two years in prison, Dr. Constantine was seized with a bloody flux, which put an end to his miseries in this world. The process, however, was carried on against his body, which, at the ensuing auto de fe, was publicly burnt. The Life of William Gardner William Gardner was born at Bristol, received a tolerable education, and was at a proper age placed under the care of a merchant named Paget. 
At the age of 26 years, he was, by his master, sent to Lisbon to act as factor. Here he applied himself to the study of the Portuguese language, executed his business with assiduity and dispatch, and behaved with the most engaging affability to all persons with whom he had the least concern. He conversed privately with a few whom he knew to be zealous Protestants, and at the same time cautiously avoided giving the least offense to any who were Roman Catholics. He had not, however, hitherto gone into any of the popish churches. A marriage being concluded between the king of Portugal's son and the Infanta of Spain, upon the wedding day the bridegroom, bride, and the whole court went to the cathedral attended by multitudes of all ranks of people, and among the rest, William Gardner, who stayed during the whole ceremony and was greatly shocked at the superstitions he saw. The erroneous worship which he had seen ran strongly in his mind. He was miserable to see a whole country sunk into such idolatry, when the truth of the gospel might be so easily obtained. He therefore took the inconsiderate, though laudable design into his head of making a reform in Portugal or perishing in the attempt, and determining to sacrifice his prudence to his zeal, though he became a martyr upon occasion. To this end he settled all his worldly affairs, paid his debts, closed his books, and consigned over his merchandise. On the ensuing Sunday he went again to the cathedral church with the New Testament in his hand and placed himself near the altar. The king and the court soon appeared, and a cardinal began mass at that part of the ceremony in which the people adore the wafer. Gardner could hold out no longer, but springing towards the cardinal he snatched the host from him and trampled it under his feet. This action amazed the whole congregation and one person drawing a dagger wounded Gardner in the shoulder and would by repeating the blow having finished him had not the king called to him to desist. Gardner being carried before the king the monarch asked him what countryman he was to which he replied quote, I am an Englishman by birth a Protestant by religion and a merchant by occupation. What I have done is not out of contempt to your royal person, God forbid it should, but out of an honest indignation to see the ridiculous, superstitious, and gross idolatries practiced here." End quote. The king, thinking that he had been stimulated by some other person to act as he had done, demanded who was his abettor, to which he replied, quote, My own conscience alone. I would not hazard what I have done for any man living but I owe that and all other services to God." End quote. Gardner was sent to prison, and a general order issued to apprehend all Englishmen in Lisbon. This order was in a great measure put into execution, some few escaping, and many innocent persons were tortured to make them confess if they knew anything of the matter. In particular, a person who resided in the same house with Gardner was treated with unparalleled barbarity to make him confess something which might throw a light upon the affair. Gardner himself was then tormented in the most excruciating manner, but in the midst of all his torments, he glorified in the deed. Being ordered for death, a large fire was kindled near a gibbet. Gardner was drawn up to the gibbet by pulleys and then let down near the fire, and not so close as to touch it, for they burnt or rather roasted him by slow degrees. Yet he bore his sufferings patiently and resigned his soul to the Lord cheerfully. It is observable that some of the sparks that were blown from the fire which consumed Gardner towards the haven burnt one of the king's ships of war and did other considerable damage. The Englishmen who were taken up on this occasion were soon after Gardner's death all discharged, except the person who resided in the same house with him, who was detained two years before he could procure his liberty.